I was born into a family in another country that was in real estate development. My grandfather and my father built pretty large scale real estate, hospitals, a part of an airport, big stuff. And as a little child at home, whether I wanted to or not, I was exposed to real estate talk all the time, especially on the dinner table. So what is the takeaway that a little child it takes? From all the friends and family that visited us, I could tell people who owned apartments and houses were rich. That was the little boy's perspective. People who didn't, not as much. And there were two sentences that my family used all the time that kind of burned into my mind. And the two sentences that I kept hearing as a child around our dinner table were accompanied by the following hand motion. And they went like this. The first one was, why didn't we buy this home 10 years ago? We should have, oh, what a mistake. And then the second one was, why did we sell these homes 10 years ago? We should never have sold them. There would have been so much. As a kid, that's what I retained. So while my family was walking around with dents in their forehead, I just was kind of assimilating these messages in a childish way. I came to the US to finish up my graduate studies in electrical engineering, completely high tech, computer science. I went to Stanford. I even taught at Stanford. I was a graduate student. You know, when you're a graduate student, you do your research in the lab on campus. You ride your bike. You're a poor student, basically. And then I got my first job in Silicon Valley at Hewlett Packard Labs. HP Labs is just a couple of miles from the Stanford campus. So I could live in the same place and bike to the labs and still doing some of my research at Stanford. Now, two things happened when I got my first job at HP. Number one, I was getting a salary of a Silicon Valley engineer. To a graduate student, that seemed like a lot. I thought I became rich at the time. And then I was the youngest person in my research group. Research groups usually have older scientists. And many of my colleagues were in their 40s and 50s and even more, you know, a couple of them. So financially, I was not impressed at all. Here was a guy working decades in Silicon Valley, getting paid very well. And what do they really have to show for it? They, they own home a couple of cars and a 401k plan. And that was just about it. I said, there's no way I'm gonna work here for decades and that's what I'm gonna have to show. I'm gonna go out and use the great credit that I have as an engineer in Silicon Valley, getting a steady salary. And the salary that I'm getting, I was a single guy, I didn't need much, to start investing in something. Because of my real estate background, I said, I'm gonna look at buying rental homes. That was when I discovered the absolutely shocking bit of information that the 30-year fixed rate loan existed in the United States. We talked about it before. I was blown away. I said, how could it be? I need to get as many of these loans as I possibly can. And mind you, in the 1980s when I was doing it, the rates were 14%. It was still exciting for me. Today, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, as an investor, which is a little higher than a homeowner, you can get four and a half, 4.6, some of the lowest rates in the past 50 or 60 years, and you can posturize them forever. That's even much more exciting. You have a very lucky window right now before the Fed starts raising rates like everybody says that they will do. So I started looking at buying homes right there in Silicon Valley. When I was doing it in the 1980s, there was an unwritten rule that said, only buy real estate within 30 minutes drive of where you live. I said, who made up this rule? Is this in you know, the constitution? I mean, what, what? Who made it up? Why do I need to buy exactly where I live? Why do I have to kiss the house goodbye? By the way, you can't even do that because if you get into your yard, you're encroaching on your tenant's rights. You can't do that legally. So. What, what do they need me for? I was too busy to take care of the home anyway. I was using a property manager. So I said, I don't like this so-called rule because I didn't like the numbers in Silicon Valley. Back in the 1980s, obviously, the prices were a lot cheaper, but also the rents were a lot cheaper. And the rents were too low relative to the prices in a way that just did not work, especially when the rates were 14%. So with a little research, I saw that if I hop on a plane 
and I go to a smaller city called Las Vegas, it took about an hour and a half by plane, I could buy homes in similar location that cost four times less, but would rent for only two times less. That was a completely different world. Started going to Vegas every week, and eventually I found my bearings. I got connections with local brokers who knew what I was looking for. I identified a good property management firm because obviously I needed someone to take care of my rental as I was living in Palo Alto, California. And at the end of one year, I owned 22 homes. It's not as impressive as it sounds because back in the 1980s, these homes were less than 40,000 each. At the time, it was easy to get financing with only 10% down, sometimes even only five. So financially, it wasn't a very daunting to do. Maybe it was good that I did it instead of talking a lot about it. During the year of doing it, my Silicon Valley friends, all logical engineers, made merciless fun of me for doing that. You're crazy, you're going out of there, the, the rule says uh, 30 minutes drive. After a year, they all wanted in. I said, what do you want from me? I said, no, you already know what you're doing. You're in Vegas, you have your managers and your realtor, lead us. So I led them. I led a group of maybe 20 engineers and we ended up buying 250 homes in Vegas over a few years. We didn't buy them as a group. He bought three, she bought four, I bought another three, etc. But because I was the leader of the group, to the service providers, the property managers, the realtors, we appeared to be a very large client. So even the engineer who bought one home enjoyed the same clout as if they bought 250 homes. That's a very simple business concept, but it works. They wanted to please us because they didn't want to lose 250 homes if somebody was dissatisfied. At the end of 1987, Las Vegas started going up. We kept what we had already bought, but we didn't continue because it went up. We went to Portland, Oregon. In Oregon, they have very high property taxes, some of the highest in the country. Yet, the city was cheap enough for the numbers to work very well. We bought in Portland through the year of 1988, and guess what happened the end of 1988, 1989? We already discussed that before. There was a boom. So we stopped buying in Portland and we moved. And from 1989, we were buying in Phoenix, Arizona, where from 1989 till the end of 2004, and I don't think I have to tell you why we stopped buying there at the end of 2004, it was another boom. We bought 3,000 homes. Me, my friends, my investors, my engineers from Silicon Valley, and it all grew. Why did it grow? Because people started getting very curious about what we were doing. I started getting invited to speak. I spoke to investment clubs. And in one of the lectures in San Francisco was a reporter for the now defunct San Francisco Examiner. In the Sunday paper, there was a big article about me and what we were doing. The whole thing exploded. At the time, it was a lot more fun to do and exciting, and I felt like I was changing people's lives to the, for the better more than working in Silicon Valley. So, I was in a startup at the time. When the startup died, I decided not to go back to tech. It was a little scary not to, not to get a paycheck anymore, and I formed our company, ICG, about 30 years ago, and we've been doing it ever since similarly. We go to large metropolitan areas in the United States. I've been a student of the demographics, and we'll talk about that a little more in another segment. We create a team in place, local property management firms that came with recommendations, local brokers that came through our contacts. We give them the acid test by buying some properties with them and seeing how they do. If we don't like a piece of the puzzle, we replace it until we do. And then we have a team. And now we buy, I buy, my friends buy, my investors buy, and we've done it in at least 30 or 35 cities in the country, close to 10,000 homes over the past 30 years. Very passionate about it, and you're absolutely welcome to use the infrastructures and the team that we have in many of those markets to build your own portfolio.